Hello and welcome to episode 19 of Entertainment of Excellence, the podcast where we talk about films, TV, all of it. Hi, I'm Ollie. I'm Tom. And I'm Ben. Today we're going to be discussing the 1998 film, The Interview. This will contain spoilers. <laughs> So, uh, today we're talking about the 1998 film, The Interview, which is an Australian film. So, I don't know if it actually fully got rated in America or in the UK. But, anyway, uh, it stars Hugo Weaving and Tony Martin as someone who is being interviewed for stealing a car and the policeman, respectively. Uh, But you quickly find out that it's not just about this stolen car. There's also a string of missing people that they think are linked to it. And they, you know, they really try and press him. Uh, and then he confesses, spoiler, he confesses to killing these like six people. Um, but then it gets discredited because they were being like too aggressive towards him. Right, and mm-hmm. yeah. they're being investigated by some toe cutters. <laughs> Great. Word. Unfortunately, they do not t- cut toes. They actually uh, investigate the ethics of the investigations. But oh well, and they say, "No, you did wrong. This is bad. We can't. We we have to release him." And then he walks away, and he's like, "He he he," and that's <laughs> the end. <laughs> exactly what happened. Yeah, that's I, I think. He went ha ha ha. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that's what, that's exactly what happened. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, well, <laughs> well, 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 where should we start? Uh, well, um, did let's, you think, let's um, start with was like. It tense? Yeah, let's start with just like the the mood um, and the vibe, so to speak. What did you think of the the sort the vibe. of vibe? It was I think building? it did really well to kind of have that tense feeling. And uh, I have to admit, I'm a bit biased. I really like the kind of you know police interview scenes and the really long ones as well, where yeah, they're both trying to get information out of each other, and it's kind of like a battle of the minds and stuff. You like ooh. For example, there was that um, recently the Criminal series on Netflix. They did one for like every single country in the entire world, uh, where it, that entire episode is just set in an interview room and they're all about an hour long. And I really liked them. So, uh, yeah. So I really liked this. And I thought it did well at being tense. And at the start, you don't really know if he's done it or not. Obviously, at the end, he has. Mm. It's never yeah. said, but would an innocent person walk away from an interview grinning? <laughs> yeah, I think well, maybe. Yeah, go on. Maybe he's uh, happy he's not getting away with being falsely accused. I guess, but well, <laughs> yeah, you, 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 I wouldn't. You, I wouldn't you know. grin that much. <laughs> no, <laughs> I think the the film's premise was. Um, very simple, given that most of the scenes happened in around the police station and in the interview room. Um, like, and I suppose also this ties in a bit with cinematography, or might be getting a bit ahead of myself here, but the, um, the main scenes were just in this small interview room with, uh, the guy of uh, I've forgotten his name already um the protagonist um the two policemen are the opposite side of the table um and it's lit so that you can't really see anything in the background and the focus is on the characters their facial expressions their 
quite a few great close-up shots when it's getting quite tense between um, with the officer called Steel um, and the protagonist. You're going to have to fill me in with his name. Fleming, that's it. Edward, Edward Fleming. Yeah, yeah. the The scenes where it, it there's obviously tension between Steel and Fleming. Um, there's some great close up shots there, and I think given that there's no, I guess, additional stimuli, there's no audio really other than them talking. There's no visual other than them being sat at the table. It's very much, um how the actors are portraying little nuances of the characters and like for example like we all like we know that hugo weaving's a great actor but i think this mm. really highlighted how great he was because at the start you really got you could really sympathize with him um being just dragged out of his home being scared witless um being put in a situation where uh, he has no clue what's going on. It seems like he's being framed. But then towards the end, it shifts and you end up feeling more sorry for Steel and how he's essentially like spiraling downwards into um, just a pit and that he's created and he he can't get out because otherwise his reputation will be ruined. Mm. Yeah, I, I did like that progression from like at the start, Fleming, as you say, you feel sorry for him, and he's sort of being manipulated by Steel to an extent, but maybe not the moral sense that um, they, he's accused of at the end. But then he almost grows complacent, and you start to see Fleming. He's the one that's able to manipulate the situation. I personally found more compelling when it flipped towards Fleming sort of having the upper hand. And I think mm. one of the quite interesting things mm. it did is you have like the gritty reality of the the interview and then also the what's going on in the background with uh, like investigating Steele. But then a lot of the like flashbacks or sequences where he's describing um the the killings or one in particular, um, they're a little bit more sort of, uh, they're not focused on that realism, they're more, I don't know, he, they sort of just present it in a, a weird way with scene where he's sort of seen his, uh, the people that he's killed before, and he, he's sort of left either, is he telling the truth or is is he insane? And you, you're never entirely sure who you should be supporting or even believing. Yeah. Mm. It's, it is like a really good, because obviously, I don't know how Hugo even manages to be like that spilled of man, then instantly becomes kind of, he seems like really devious and he really takes over this screen. Like you have to focus on Hugo Weaving. Where it, from this, you go from the start of like, you all know these cops have been terrible to him and you don't really like them and you fear for Edward Fleming and then it just flips midway through to uh, every time that the, the police go into the room with him it's you know it gets really tense and on edge so he, he does really well yeah. with his mm. performance I think that sort of pivotal scene is is quite hard to distinguish exactly when it occurs because there's obviously that sort of trivial thing about him not being fed, but it's quite hard to pinpoint exactly that turning point when he gains the upper hand and he starts to be the one manipulating steel rather than the other way around. Mm. Yeah. Uh, the cinematography really helps the tension as well. There's a lot of really close-up shots, and also the, it had like quite a bit of style. There's some more different shots that you might normally see. There were, I noticed a few tilted ones, especially when he's going into the uh, station and kind of one shot almost from the corner of a room as he was walking into the interview room. 
and if you remember it goes like round a pillar yeah uh, that was cool uh, uh oh yeah and the start uh i can't i didn't remember so i've been refreshed that it's like the first shot is a stack of fluttering newspapers that like fly away in the wind and then it cuts to fleming in his flat with a clock and it's all really stylistic hmm which is which is difficult seeing as old it's in one room of it is in one room with yeah. three characters basically but somehow it should have a unique style and some quite impactful shots I'd say that films and well TV episodes as well that are sort of based around that premise of everything being set in one room and it's more about the relationships and tensions between characters in the room rather than anything external. I find as long as it's done right, I find those pretty much universally very um, enjoyable. The problem is you, the problem is there are quite a few examples of it not being done right. Um, because you could take it too far into the sort of cliche of um, just everything breaking down and some one person going insane and the other people having to deal with it. But here it was a lot more nuanced, I guess, with um, by the end, the viewer sort of understands that Fleming is mentally unstable and ha probably has committed those crimes um, mm. maybe not exactly in the way that he said but um, there's that just the fact that you can they did that didn't screw it up and then did their own unique take on it I find really compelling and enjoyable because mm. <clears throat> even after he admits to them he always had me convinced with uh when the like chief detective inspector or whatever came in and he said that he was coerced into making f a false confession and i always believed him like yeah same <laughs> that's how good the writing yeah. and the acting was so it yeah it does really well at keeping you intrigued i mean it's an hour and 40 minutes which obviously it's not that long for a film but set in one room you couldn't imagine it to drag, but actually, I was never bored. It was really well paced throughout. I yeah. felt, yeah, yeah, it definitely didn't drag. I think partly that was to do with the fact that, um, well, the film itself is sort of structured around the the interview itself. So there's going to be the interview, and then there'll be breaks in between where, um the cameras will go outside of the room and characters will go off and have different discussions. Um, and I think the fact that those breaks sort of separated the, the interview were really effective in sort of keeping the pace going and not... Yeah. Because if it was an hour and 40 minutes in one room specifically, it would have been very hard for them to keep it interesting and I think it probably would have ended up dragging at least a little bit even with the amazing cinematography, great acting um, and most of all great story but uh, yeah the and especially because quite near the start it's shown that Steel um, isn't like uh, flawless and there's sort of a bit of a some complaints going behind his back and he he sort of threatens his uh subordinate and is like don't you don't you dare say things about me behind my back which sort of foreshadows the conclusion um yeah well for me i never felt that he was it was entirely immoral or corrupt in his methods i think it may have um the other detective who he was with clearly oh, wasn't yeah. very experienced 
advanced and he was sort of quite impulsive. But um, I think one line that sticks for me with Steel, sort of when when Fleming first describes the killing in quite a lot of depth, well, quite crucially says that it wasn't even intentional. He sort of inadvertently beat him to death when he thought he was still asleep. Um, but one that sticks with me was sort of Steel questioning what it felt like and sort of how he'd always thought about it from his own perspective. And then later you see, one, I think it's one of the people investigating uh, the morals of like the interviewing, yeah. uh, sort of watching that line back. Mm. I think that's one of the, the things where you sort of like, is he immoral? Is he almost able to relate too well with Fleming? Maybe that's maybe Fleming is sort of sort of not entirely telling the truth because he's able to take advantage of precarious steel a uh, position that steals in hmm. yeah i found i mean one small criticism i'd have of it was the fact that um fleming's transition from well in the in the eyes of the viewer just a normal man going about his everyday business who's been ambushed and taken into police custody for something he's probably been fl- framed to. To go from that to completely 180, confessing his crimes um, without a hint of holding back his... his like, he exudes confidence in the, uh, in the interrogation room and it's quite clear that he exudes so much confidence that the... that Steele and the other detective are sort of disgusted by him and a bit disturbed. I just felt that that transition was like a... Com- it was a bit jarring, I guess. Like, I, I get what they were going for, because somehow uh, Fleming must have learnt that Steele's in a precarious position, and thinking through it, he can use that to his advantage, get him get steel to make a make a fool of himself and use that to render the whole interview um not uh I've forgotten the word <laughs> render it unusable um mm. i just I, I might not have been paying attention i just didn't understand how he worked that out um it did a bit like unanticipated it was just suddenly yeah. thrown at you it, it, it never like the whole first act sort of there wasn't I think it might have been more effective if there were sort of hints that he was I don't know that he was getting inklings that he was in this position or whether or if he you know there's hints to the fact that he has actually killed them but he does seem very he did denies any claims and then suddenly as you say it's just a 180 out of nowhere yeah i quite like it though <laughs> yeah I, it, I, it has a kind of unpredicted twist it, and i like it it just seems very jarring i i think i'd have preferred it if maybe it was very clear that um fleming had overheard something or um but he maybe didn't need to because uh I mean, the boss had already talked about it, but you know, he knew that they'd been threatening him, and they had denied him food. And the only time that he then finally says that he'd like confess for the food, so he he knows he can use it against them, because yeah, I think he's supposed to be very intelligent. So that that's how I assume that he knew it would be unusable. Yeah. I don't know, I just felt it would have been nicer if there'd been a couple hints or something. I I guess that's probably down to personal taste. Yeah. Yeah. What did you think of the... Oh, uh, oh, go on. I was just going to say another thing about Steel, like another line that I remember 
when he sort of he's trying to relate to him further when he's like makes up that story about his dad drowning the cat and it's just mm. subtle things like that that he sort of the I can see why he might they might be perceived as immoral or unprovoked because he's sort of trying to get him on his side and it, it could be seen as being a bit ruthless. Yeah. Uh, what did you think of the score? So I I liked it. It wasn't particularly memorable. It did help. Especially um I've noticed that scenes after the interviews had been uh been like ended that it would be this sort of piano melody um which would sort of help to like bring the tension down honestly i i i was this is probably just me being weird but i i was surprised it was orchestral i felt it was going to be more or the mood would have been a bit more like synth based but um yeah yeah, yeah, I I wasn't a huge fan of it. I thought it did its job and it was all right, but um I I did expect I I didn't didn't feel like it fit the tone yeah fully. I don't know. It it, it, felt, it felt almost outdated. The, yeah. I don't which I think the it says the story is based on like a 1952 episode of a TV show. Yeah, like I feel if it was in the fifties, then it would have been fine. But but it's not to say that orchestral music's outdated or it doesn't have a place. I just think it felt a bit out here. Mm. Yeah. Maybe it's because there are a lot of the films in the sort of same genre or same tone of more sort of like low looming synth notes or something. I don't know. Mm. Yeah. But again, it did do its job. I mean, it set a tone. It wasn't like it was jarring. Yeah. But, but, I don't know. It felt it like was it like slapped on better. top rather than part of, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Because did the actual interview scenes mainly have no score? Yeah, they would. I think so, yeah. And I quite enjoyed that because quite I think it might have been quite effective to sort of have some sort of like light motif that ran through um that sort of represented um like Fleming as this psychopath or something because that could have helped. I know you might not agree as much, Tom, but we were saying about how you don't feel it as much early on maybe that could have sort of assisted that if there was some sort of yeah. repeated uh, little melody or something that presented it. yeah because I mean we haven't rewatched it so there could be stuff we missed but, but I'm not sure well I feel that the after the interviews there were there was a sort of small piano thing, but there wasn't any memorable melody or it didn't really serve much purpose other than to bring down the tension. I think like if there was, yeah, if there was like a motif that showed that Fleming's like not what he seems, yeah, mm. that would have helped a bit and made it a bit less jarring perhaps. I don't know. I've seen quite a few reviews saying that it sort of falls flat at the end and it, it's sort of left unresolved. I don't agree with entirely it. I wasn't a huge fan of the the bit, not right at the end, with Fleming being released, but before, I think it was before that or around then when uh, Steele's been interviewed himself. I, I think the bit at the end where he sort of goes, oh, that's like malicious, that's uh, insulting. I don't think that quite worked for me because it just seemed a bit cheesy, I guess. Yeah. 
but I get it makes sense in the context. I definitely I liked the ending with Fleming being released because that's sort of like a lack of justice and it makes it makes you definitely feel an element of pathos for steel because it says that it's happened like four times in the past three years. So you sort of feel that he's being treated differently. Yeah. Mm. I kind of wish it didn't really at the end kind of go, oh yeah, he definitely is the killer, by the way. <laughs> it would have been nice if it was yeah. one you could argue about. <clears throat> yeah. Uh, like, it didn't explicitly say, but it was probably a bit too obvious. I mean, it also showed him hitchhiking at the end. Well, yeah, yeah. It was... When I say I did... A, um, it didn't explicitly say it's just like it didn't show him murdering or it didn't show him like confessing mm. to someone. But I'm um, yeah, it was too too in your face. It would have been maybe better if I think the whole hitchhiking thing could have been removed and just if it had just left with him smiling a little bit. Mm. I don't know. Yeah, I think it was subtle. But... Or maybe I mean I, guess, I don't know. Go on. It's never fully resolved. He could say like I guess some people could still argue that he he hadn't committed those crimes. I guess you could make an argument for that. Mm. The the odds are against you. Yeah. Um. I mean, the editing must have been good because I didn't notice it, which usually means that's usually a good thing unless it's trying to be very stylistic. And yeah. Obviously, this is more of a subtle, understated, um, you know, cere- cerebral drama, I guess, or thriller. So it, it's not going to have, like, Tarantino editing or Edgar Wright editing, is it? So no. if it's not... It wasn't jarring or anything, so, I mean... Pretty standard. <laughs> yeah. Um, the one thing I will say is that we did like really hate one of the characters. Oh, I mean, you yeah. probably are, but really just is this detective Wayne Pryor. You just want to slap him the entire film. He's so annoying. He's like, <laughs> he just oh, bullies no. everyone. He's bullying his, someone that he gets to look through newspapers. He's bullying... Uh, I mean, I guess he is a serial killer, but he's still bullying Eddie, Eddie Fleming. If he didn't bully him, then maybe they could have convicted him. So, you know. <laughs> he's like the definition of an inexperienced detective, and he's not, like, reprimanded at all, apart from, uh, well, uh, Steele, like, <laughs> choking him a bit at the start and going, don't spread rumours behind my back. But he doesn't say anything about his behaviour, and um, mm. it felt a bit unfair towards Steele at the end, given a lot of the intimidation came from, uh, what's his name, Pryor. And yeah. it's just put down to, well, this is Steele teaching him bad things. Um, yeah. But he was just a jerk and an inexperienced detective. It's like, he felt like if one, if you picked a person off the street and told them to be a detective for a day, that's what he'd be like. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> I I did not like that character and I guess that <laughs> his face too. was punchable as well. <laughs> but like it's it's predominantly him that sort of did all the things that Steele's accused of. Despite the fact that he was mostly silent. Well, I yeah. think he was always silent when they were actually recording because he was told to be. But it's mm. just, it's just unfortunate that a lot of the blame was just directed single-handedly to Steele. Yeah. Mm. But I think well, Fleming's performance. I think we haven't really discussed that too much, but he always has like that looming presence that. I think he does a great job of, even when 
he's not the one that even before he's confessed or even like the the first scene when he's pretty vulnerable and sort of being abducted he's still always got that i don't know there's just something about the way he looks that mm. you're always got that he's kind of down yeah hugo weaving always dominates the screen for me it's just every scene he's in is going to be good <laughs> yeah yeah and and the the actor of yeah actor of steel as well was good. He did he yeah. did really well. I mean, obviously, he's not got as much of a chance to show off like Hugo uh, Weaving did. But yeah, something about him. I don't know if this was intentional, but sort of when Fleming was confessing sort of smirking as if either he's feeling we've got him and he's he's confessing he's guilty he's gonna mm. be gonna get the right treatment that he deserves or he's sort of he's just sort of bewildered at this sadistic uh personality and he's trying to he's, he's sort of trying to relate to it in some way that he's finding impossible but I think that was quite a subtle uh, acting point that I picked up on. Yeah. Mm. <clears throat> hmm. Also, the uh, the leader of like the the group that are investigating the morals of the methods that they use. I think he he did a good job of being this. Another character that you sort of love to hate because yeah, he's not really providing any justice for Steel. Well, I think I didn't like, really hate him, but you felt that he was always just going to follow the rules. Yeah, with... yeah. Sort of wasn't he? Wasn't really human. He was just sort of the personification of a system. Yeah, because. Hmm. There was there was also the random like uh, reporter character. Oh yeah. That, um, yeah. So they're, I guess, an embodiment of the media, and that the police will sometimes sell out to them, but compromise investigations in doing so just because they want to get their name in the paper. Yeah. Should we? Do you want to give ratings and final thoughts? Yeah. Um, well, I thought it was a great movie. Um, there was I, I, the thing that really stands out to me is the uh, the jarring transition from uh, from Fleming being well. He assumed innocent to uh, being, well, an absolute psychopath. I felt that if that was a bit less jarring, then I would have enjoyed it a lot more. Um, mm -hmm. um, Rating-wise, I feel... It's high sevens, definitely, because the style was good. Um, I love the cinematography and the, the sort of focus on the characters in the interview scenes with no background stimulus, no unnecessary music, literally just two people, oh, sorry, three people in a room discussing something. So I feel... That's the new one ever really here. Uh, mm, yes, I'm good. Uh, no, I'm gonna go. <laughs> well, I'm stuck between you and ever really here Pick and one. marriage story, so I'm gonna go between 7.7 and 7.8. I'm gonna go 7.75, which rounds up to 7.8. Okay. I wonder what we're looking at the the website. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Entertainment of Excellence dot Weebly dot com. Yep. Yeah. Go check us out. Cheeky plug. 
Uh, well, I, I mean, I really liked it, but I don't know if I would put it that high. Oh no, is yeah. Ben gonna give? Wait, you are not give the... a lower rating than Ben. You're not giving it ten stars out of ten, no. <laughs> dude. What have thinking... you come to? Have we got Tom thinking... on rather than Thom? <laughs> oh no, <laughs> I was thinking like seven point six. So we're talking so two point two points different. <laughs> <laughs> that's in. That's a lot. Go on, Ollie. What would five? <laughs> well, oh. I am going to be even more harsh. Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> what is this? We're just reversing the order. <laughs> this is madness. Um, I did enjoy it a lot, but there's, there's a couple of flaws, and it, I just don't think it had the story. I, I, I think I tend to lean more towards story based films whereas yeah. this was very much it was just playing on like the natural environment and it, using like acting and cinematography to sort of enhance the story but I don't think that overrides the fact that there was minimal story in my opinion so I'm going to give it a 7.3 <laughs> You 7. are so high. 7.55. Fine already. On the, the, the bottom. I, I, I can't <laughs> believe you are. You, has it really come to this? <laughs> it has. <laughs> nice. Or maybe I'll have like a full 180 and say, oh no, it's a, I now think that it's a, an 8. Eight point five. <laughs> I'll show off. You know it's, it's a 10 two. out of 10. <laughs> it's a 2. Yeah. Oh no. <laughs> um, well, Agreed. what a rating. <laughs> so, uh, we don't have Get any. Get angry at us in the comments if you don't agree. Please just leave a comment. Please. Sh shout out to one of us. I showed you my rating, please respond. <laughs> <laughs> Talking of showing us our ratings, Ooh. should we now show our recommendations? Well, first I need to plug the submission spotlight, Tom. Oh, Christine. sorry. I'm sorry. It's, this is it's what happens when you're a special guest. <laughs> oh, no. Please don't put me back in the special guest room. We'll remove the H from your name and add the S. No, anything but a <laughs> special guest room. So, we don't have any submission spotlight submissions this week because I haven't <laughs> put the, the post up... Um, advertising it i'll be doing that but in the meantime if you are a creator and you do entertainments whether that's music short movies comics like art i don't know whatever um as long as it's appropriate literally anything <laughs> okay yeah. you know honestly we're, we're getting desperate <laughs> <laughs> Just um, send it in. We'll dedicate a 10 minutes, well, it's usually about 10 minutes, uh, section to giving you some feedback, a bit of constructive criticism, but not too much that we demoralize you. And <laughs> we'll be nice. And we'll give you a little bit of uh, advertising to our 22 follower Instagram. Please follow <laughs> us there at EOV Podcast. Thanks. Um,. And so, yeah, it's just a great opportunity to get like a third person's perspective on your work, and we'd love to see it. So you can send that in to entertainmentofexcellence at gmail.com, or you can contact us through our website, which is entertainmentofexcellence.weebly.com. You can message us on Instagram or Twitter, both of them are at EV Podcast. Um, or just like leave a link wherever we, we check most places. So that would be cool. Thank you. Now it's yes. time for recommendations. Okay. Uh, who will, shall I go first? Because I initiated recommendation time. Oh, yes. Time. Okay. Um, so this week I am recommending a comic series which I think I alluded to before. Ooh. I'm slightly worried I recommended it before, but I've read more of it, so I'm going to recommend the later ones technically. 
So that's what I'm going to say if I have recommended it already. So I'm recommending the series Sandman by Neil Gaiman. I mean, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a massive comic series. I'm sure many people have heard of it. Uh, it's DC. It's, um, it's about Morpheus, who is the king of dreams. And in the first one, he gets captured by humans and then needs to break out and recover lost items. And then after that, it kind of just follows his journeys and different at each like volume that you get is actually a different story, which is quite nice. So that you're not just left on cliffhangers every time. Uh, and I've recently just read up to the fourth volume, which is extremely good uh, about Morpheus inheriting the key to hell. And many people would like it. So you get to see like... Norse gods, Egyptian gods, angels, uh, agents of chaos. There's an agent of order who is embodied as a cardboard box. Brilliant. <laughs> this is a, a volume where Neil Gaiman really shows off both his kind of like his unique storytelling and these mythical creatures and the magical wonder of it, all, and also blends in like his comedy. And uh, I, I don't know if this... It, it might have a bit of horror mixed in because some of the other Sandman stories are specifically horror, like the... I can't remember what one's called, but in like the first volume, there's one set over 24 hours, which is probably... is like really horrific, but that's a good thing. And also Doll's House kind of has some horror elements in it because there's a serial killer convention and stuff. But this one isn't as much... But it's it's really good. It's kind of like on a cosmic scale because you see all these pantheons of gods coming together and interact. And it also gives a chance of Morpheus for redemption. So it's, it's a really interesting read. And uh, it also has amazing art as well. I mean, some people say it's worth... It's, it's kind of one of those comics where it's like, it's worth reading it just for the story alone. And also it's worth reading it just for the art alone. So... I mean, just brilliant all around. So read Sandman. Groovy. Oh, I, I think it's got that... an Audible original now. <laughs> or something well, weird. You haven't recommended it before, but can I just ask a quick question? Yes. Hmm? If you watch season one of a show and you recommend it, and then you watch season two of a show, are you allowed to recommend it again, officially? <laughs> Is this what you're about to do? No. Stop <laughs> gently. <laughs> I think I think I think we can. To discuss. If if it's yeah. very different, maybe. If it's a show like that, kind of just is running on and doesn't have an individual story. Okay, so let me give you an example. I'm going to say what's successful, what's not. Mad Men. If you watch seasons one, two, and three, and then recommend it, and then you watch season four, I don't think you can recommend it again. Because it's kind of all drama in the same vein. But if it's like Umbrella Academy, where the f two seasons are very different, I think you can recommend them separately. Groovy. That's my hot take. Also, R Black Mirror, you can recommend each season separately. But these are the ground rules that you're laying out as a special guest. I'm r yeah, these are special ground rules. Although, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe you can recommend stuff for just long-running dramas. Well, we'll have to Thomas. have a private Thomas. meeting with, <laughs> with our <laughs> private meeting with our executives of recommendations. Yeah, we'll get the board. Yeah. We'll get. We'll notify the board. Yes. <laughs> are the board is still busy collecting all of our recommendations, Ben. Oh yeah, they are. They're very busy. They're hard at work okay. right now. In fact. Are they compiling that list to go out on our mailing list? Another plug. Haha, <laughs> <laughs> subscribe to our mailing list, guys. <laughs> because you get access to loads of loads of stuff. Which um, yeah. I'll be sending out and then um, the board will be sending out in the next week. Indeed. Okay. Ollie. Plug. Ollie. <laughs> what am I going now? Recommend now. I mean, I don't have any, so <laughs> you need to go now, right now. Um. So, speaking of comics, Ooh. Really Ooh. Well, I have started reading 
my first ever graphic novel. <gasps> you may have heard what? of it. It's a little book called Watchmen. I'm so it's proud amazing. Of you. Yes. <laughs> yeah. I read I'm it twice. Not be that today. Oh. But... <laughs> 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 it is something. Very, it is something related to it. It's not just a random. <laughs> oh, is it the series? Just to like <laughs> tease yeah, Tom. It's the oh, okay. sequel series that came out last year. It's set thirty years after. The graphic novel. I haven't finished the graphic novel yet, but I made oh, a mistake to watch beforehand. <laughs> so I do know what happened. Oh, um, does it spoil loads of stuff? <laughs> yeah. Well, there's no squid in it. No! Uh, they cut that out of the movie as well. Why? Uh, Just have there's the giant I'm squid. On about, I'm on about there's no squid in the Zack Snyder film, but there is oh. a squid in this. In the series, so basically, <gasps> yeah, yes. Um, so basically, right. yeah, it's the sequel to the <laughs> the novel. It embraces quite a lot of the nostalgia of that because it has a lot of returning characters. I'm not going to say who because that's technically a spoiler because you don't find out till like the third episode, I think. Um, mm -hmm. It also has well, Rorschach has become like an image for white supremacists who whoa what a surprise like, <laughs> something happens at the end of the graphic novel that makes that make more sense yeah who uh have quite a big role in the show it is i understand some complaints that people say it's it's cool at times it can be basically it sets around uh solving a murder and the, it introduces some new characters such as Sister Knight and Looking Glass and mm. the character Blonde Man, who is definitely no one from the original book. Um, is it and, <laughs> <laughs> uh, um, Is it Andy? Maybe. Uh, <laughs> but then there's also later on in the season, uh, I think it's episode six and episode eight, the... They've got really good reviews, like episode eight to nine point five, and I basically they set up. They basically dedicate a whole episode to explain quite a bit of the background knowledge you'd need, not from the book, but sort of original stuff. Like episode six centers around like unhinging the murder, and also has quite a lot of hooded justice in, who was a member of the Ooh, Minutemen. Yes, episode eight. <laughs> is the introduction of a one of the original watchmen. I'm, I'm not going to say who. Uh, it, I really, uh, it's a really good show. It's probably my favourite superhero show that I've seen. Have you seen The Boys? It's able to be... Uh, no, I haven't. Okay. <laughs> it's able to be original. It also... It doesn't, even though it's sort of DC, quite a lot of the DC TV shows are like 22 episodes, sort of a story of the week sort of things that mm. really the episodes aren't really linked in together. This is just nine episodes, and I think the creator of it uh, sort of had that envisaged, and he sort of said he doesn't want to do a season two um, because everything ties together, and it's it's quite a clever plot. Um, that I guess sort of embraces the subversive masterpiece that is the graphic novel by Alan Moore. So it's definitely different to the original Watchmen, but I think it's very entertaining. Mm. It's quite interesting you say about Watch. people complaining about it getting political in quotation marks because I've heard that said before but I mean I think the original graphic novel was political in the first place Rorschach is yeah. the, he is shown to kind of be bordering racist and like a massive fan of a right wing news source so and because yeah. it's one of those where it's a great work of art but when it's misinterpreted it's quite dangerous because I know some people have kind of 
seen Rorschach as their hero, which he isn't. He is kind of a terrible person. Yeah. And he's supposed to be... Yeah, I mean, he's not He's not wholly yeah. bad, but he's supposed to be morally ambiguous and shows the dangers of kind of only seeing in black and white. Um, yeah. So I, I think um, it's fine. The show's set in a context where after a something that's called the White Knight, where the Seventh Cavalry, who are the white supremacists who wear the masks, uh, they basically like go to pretty much all the police officers' houses and kill quite a lot of them. So after that, they pass an act where masked vigilantes are illegal and all police officers have to wear a mask uh, to mm. like conceal their identity. So that there's sort of an ambiguity there with never entirely sure who is the antagonist if everyone's wearing a mask. Yeah. Which, it, which is similar to quite a lot of the themes of the original book. Cool. Ben, do you have you money, don't do you? No, I don't. I'm just great. I like that. <laughs> cool. Well, so... Um, that's cool. Had recommendations. Um, make sure to check us out on our website, entertainmentofexcellence.weebly.com, um, and sign up for the mailing list because you get access to the schedule, which means you can see stuff um, that we'll be doing like up to a month in advance, and also you'll get up master list of all recommendations which uh, the board is working on and um, most of all it's a way to see some behind the scenes stuff um, and actually there'll be some stuff going out this week because there'll be some changes next episode so that will be exciting and fun mm -hmm. um, quick apology about the audio last week where we were recording together for the first time um and there was like some leak into one of the mics and so there was a bit of an echo um but next time we're recording together that probably won't happen so just about with this we're we're learning um follow us on instagram and twitter at eov podcast um probably won't be posting clips in the near future because i'm still learning a new video editing program but um, you will keep up to date with stuff and we'll let you know when our next episodes are coming. Episodes are coming. So uh, thank you for listening. Uh, please leave a review. if that, That's another thing. Leave a review, leave a comment. Just email us, contact us. I'd love to know how well we're doing. Or if you absolutely bloody hate us, please also do that. I'd love to receive hate, receive hate mail. That would be cool. Anyway, thanks for listening. All right, see you. All right, see you. All right, see you. Yeah, that's interesting.